deputies, hey, congratulations for this documentary, Split the Root. Thank you. You know, better congratulations that this is being showcased at South by Southwest. How do you feel about this? Elated. <laughs> So, 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 so grateful because, you know, like most documentaries, this was started on a wing and a prayer. You know, we, we um, you know, I heard about the work IFT was doing. I, um, you know, I was so moved that I sent them some money and a documentary filmmaker. <laughs> um, you know, we sent uh, Linda to start filming as soon as I heard about the story and, and we were cleared by, I know, Julie and Francisco and others to do so. So, um, you know, I think we thought we would have a documentary, Maria mentioned earlier, yeah. we thought we'd have a documentary in time for, um, you know, the election, because we started in two, uh, 2018. And here we are many years later, um, but, it, you know, um, the fact that the work was recognized by South by, um, and that, you know, that we will, you know, our, our greatest hope is that we can get this in front of as many eyes as, as possible. Hopefully the entire world, that would be good. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds great. Mar Marty Maria, the, um, what, what, what was the first introduction to both of you from, um, from IFT, was it like uh, saw it on the news, or was it GoFundMe? What what was it? It's pretty. It's pretty wild. It just shows you how, as big as the world is, it can be very small. Um, it was Fourth of July weekend that year, and um, I was just inspired by you know um, the crisis to do something, and I didn't have a lot of plans, so I joined forces with another um, entertainer slash you know entertainment person, and we just did like a weekend sprint where I offered matching funds, and I literally was sitting here with a little like notebook, like writing down you know the funds, the things as they came in, and then you know doing all the calculations and. Um, we ended up raising a, a fair amount of money in a very short amount of time. And, um, and then a friend who I also had met um, because she's an author and an amazing person, she got in touch with me and said, you know, there's this other organization I really want you to know about. Um, and so that's how I found out about IFT. And, um, and the more I knew, the more I was like, this is, this is an incredible story for all, those of us who are feeling, feeling powerless. Um, that, that, you know, Julie and Francisco and the volunteers um, and, and then the connections they were making with people like Rosie and Jenny, um, that, that that was tangible. And so much of it feels out of our control. So um, that's why I jumped at the opportunity to get on in there. Well, for you, Maria. Well, Marty and I worked together. Marty, Marty spoke to Julie and called me right away. And, you know, we mainly work in narrative television and film. Marty has produced a documentary before. I, I've never made a doc, but I'm an avid doc viewer and lover. Um, and we talked about it. Like if there's the right story, like let's absolutely make a documentary. And she called and she said, I think I got it. And she told me about the organization and what they were doing. And we knew that that was a compelling way into the crisis. But as we explored, you know, soon after Jenny and Rosie's story and access to them and that there was already news footage covering their reunification was really helpful for us to tell a comprehensive story. And as Marty said, you know, we originally thought that this was going to be filmed and wrapped up much sooner, but it allowed us to really follow the process. I have to say, personally, I was somewhat naive and didn't realize that pre-COVID, the asylum seeking process to, to a hearing was 12 to 24 months. And that we were able to follow these stories and engage in Julie, I mean, in, in, in Jenny and Rosie's story and to give them a platform to share their, not only harrowing experience, but heartwarming. Um, you know, we were really inspired by who they were. So it, it all came together in the way that it should. Again, with scripted, you kind of know where you're going and you have a finite period of time and you're going to make something, but we were able to let this unravel and unfurl in, in the time that it needed to. Great. Well, 
Julie, we didn't forget you because this this is uh, your your part of you're a huge part of this story. Um, for those people, Julie, um, who don't know, could you tell us about the Immigrant Families uh, Together organization? Because it is a it is a relatively new organization in our <laughs> short history. You're muted. Uh, you're muted. You're muted. I was saying really because it feels like it's been many many years at this point. <laughs> um, yes, so I'm a former social worker and my husband who is a refugee from Cuba also has a background in social service, um, specifically working with incarcerated folks and himself has experienced immigration detention and the entire immigration adjudication process. Um, so in 2018 when we were as everybody else in this country and around the world seeing the images unfold of what was happening at the border every day I think we both just had this increasing sense of desperation as marty was saying i think most people were saying most decent people were saying how can i help but also really understanding because we come from a social work background that we wanted to help in a way that was actually helpful and not just sort of performatively helpful um, or meddling and so we were never really sure exactly what the entry point was into helping until the day that i heard um, a local attorney here in new york on the radio jose orchena talking about his client, who was Jenny, um, in the Eloy Detention Center in Arizona. And he said something that for me was just the complete aha moment, which was she doesn't have to remain in detention. She knows where her kids are, unlike plenty of the other parents who were in detention. Um, her kids are in this foster care center called Cayuga in New York City. She can be reunited with them. She just needs to have her bond paid, and then she needs to get from Arizona to New York. And I thought, well, that's really concrete and tangible. That seems like something that's doable. I talked to my husband that night and I said, I think that we should do this, but you have to understand, like, if we're going to do this, it's a long-term thing. It's not, we're not just going to pay the bond and that's it. Goodbye. Good luck. She's going to like land in New York city. Like, you know, because this was your experience too. Like you need some support to navigate that. So like, we need to plan on being part of a long-term community of support and he said yeah you know we have to do this like I this is an opportunity for me to pay back my experience he um came as a refugee in the Mardiel boat lifts in 1980 and for reasons that neither of us can still understand fell into a wealthy white family in Cambridge Massachusetts um, <laughs> who was very progressive um deeply involved in, in 1980s activism there and um, really felt that this was an opportunity for himself to be able to kind of pay it forward. And so um, we marinated on that over the weekend. And then on the following Monday, I called Jose Orochena, who answered on the first ring. <laughs> and I said, hi, I heard you on the radio. I really think that we can raise this money among our angry friends. Would that be okay? And he just started laughing hysterically. And he said, of course it would be okay. Like she has no money. Her family has no money. She has no means of paying bond. And I said, well, could we start a GoFundMe campaign for her? And he said, yes. And so we did. Um, at the time, we didn't know that the bond was just $7,500. And by the next morning, we had already raised that money and more. And it was not stopping. And what happened was um, a few sort of perfect storm elements was that when Jenny got released, she was the first woman, as far as we know, um, who had been separated from her kids to be released from that facility on bond and reunited with her children. So it spurred tremendous media attention also because at that point I was a journalist. So I was able to harness a lot of media friends to cover the story. Um, and, uh, and they did. So there was tremendous media coverage, tremendous political involvement because people felt this is something we can actually do and that we can be a part of, which was critical. The other really crucial piece was that Jenny came out of detention with a list, a mental list of names of other women with whom she had been detained, who also knew where their children were and said, can you help them? And because the money kept coming in, we said, well, yes, we can. And that sort of just then generated uh, this, you know, self feedback loop of like seeing more people get out, made more people donate money, made more media coverage. Um, and it hasn't stopped ever since. Wow. <laughs> I mean, and, and this all spawned from that zero tolerance policy that, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. or a lot of us on this side of the border are not really aware of. But, uh, but you know, Trump's no longer in office. People say Trump's no longer in office. Why is this still an issue? 
I think the documentary does such a fantastic job of answering that question. Um, Megan Finn, who was and remains one of IFT's most devoted volunteers and who went off to start her own organization as well, says it so succinctly in the film, this is not just a Trump administration issue. Um, and then Linda's and, and the production team's acquisition of all of these news headlines that you see flash across in a series that show the temporal, you know, the timeline of our failed immigration policies in this country really show that this is a problem that's been going on since our founding days, right? That it's not a one administration problem. The difference is, is that in the Trump administration, all of the sort of traditional uh, suppression of this from the public view was brought into full light, right? And that I think um, was sort of the shock for so many people in this country. I think what the film does is really, um, depolarizes the issue by saying it's not just a Trump administration issue. It's an issue that undergirds all of our immigration policies and approaches in this country. And that is the locus of reform. Hmm. Maria, Marty, um, you know, it, it is a, the, your fascinating subjects of us, Jenny and, and Rosie. Um, I mean, it's, it's a, their tales are great, but how do you manage to convince them to participate in this documentary? Because, you know, for a lot of us, this is a tough story to tell. Well, Julie had made so many inroads, you know, they were already very willing to tell their story. And Julie, you may be able to articulate this, this better as to why they realized that um, giving media coverage would, would help them and others like them. Yeah. So, um, as I mentioned, Jenny really early on had massive media coverage. Um, and she said frequently to the media and to us, because we kept checking in with her, we said, is this too much? This feels like a lot. Like it's, it's the, the media spotlight on her was just intense. And she said, it's a lot. And I also feel like this is what I want to do because I want the women who I left behind to know that I'm fighting for them. I mean, women in detention centers were seeing stories about themselves on the news, right? But they were never sources of those stories. And so she and Rosie both felt very strongly as have other family members that we support and have supported that if they had the opportunity to speak to press, they wanted to do that because they wanted to be able to A, share their own stories, but B, remind the public that women and other people were still detained. They were still separated from their children. Um, they wanted people to understand what the detention center conditions were like, which were horrible. I mean, in the documentary, you hear the story of Irma, who um, was actually Jenny's uh, cellmate at Eloy, and Irma had passed away. The doctor, um, this is not a part of that story that's told in the film, but a friend of mine um, from college is a doctor in Boston who helps a lot of the families that we have in that area and actually hosts one of our families for long term. Aww. And she was a member of a secret Facebook group of doctors uh, responding um, during the zero tolerance crisis. The doctor who actually was the admitting doctor for Irma was in that Facebook group and said overtly in the group, I firmly believe that if Irma had gotten attention and diagnosis while she was still in detention, she would be alive today. Um, that would have been treatable at that point. They just never cared to do that. And so it was really important to Jenny and Rosie to take every opportunity. Rosie actually um, published a book in 2020, a memoir of her experiences. And so through that experience also, she really understood the power of telling one story um, and how that could be a tool for policy change and for opening conversations. Um, she, I was the co-author on that book. And so we had hoped that um, she would be able to travel around the country and talk to book clubs and audiences directly. Um, because of the timing of it with COVID, she wasn't able to do that. But still we did a number of virtual book club visits and conversations with folks around the country. And she really saw how audiences reflected back to her, A, how powerful she was, right? But also how they suddenly felt that immigration was an issue that re was relevant to them, whereas they didn't feel that before. They didn't have somebody in their family who had emigrated in this generation. So it wasn't, they didn't feel like it was an issue they needed to have an opinion on or be informed about. 
And through conversations with her, everything from, um, we did an appearance um, for my father's church. My father is a lifelong Republican and NRA member um, who invited Rosie to speak to his church about her book. And afterward, uh, his church was just a very small town in Colorado comprised mostly of people in their eighties who are white and Republican, um, had a conversation. They got together and formed a committee to determine how they could be a welcoming congregation. Um, they live adjacent to a community primarily of Mexican and Guatemalan. Um, sorry, my oldest daughter is calling from school. Um, old, uh, migrant population of migrant workers and migrant farm workers in the corn fields and hemp fields uh, in Delta County, Colorado. And so, the, I mean, I think for Rosie, this was a powerful moment of saying and seeing how her story actually impacts change directly at the grassroots level and at larger levels. Both Jenny and Rosie and other families, for example, have testified before the Senate Finance Committee, um, before the Department of Justice, to share their stories and and those have related in direct policy changes. And we were really fortunate because by the time we got involved and, and knew that we wanted to make a documentary, they were already, Jenny and Rosie were both bonded out and in the midst of their asylum seeking process. So the fact that there was so much media attention and coverage and we could then have access to the, to the origin story of what happened when they crossed over made it really um, helpful for us to tell their story from beginning to, you know, not end, but where we are at this moment in time. Terrific. Well, let, let, let's leave with one more thought because, you know, South by Southwest audience is going to uh, watch this pretty soon and hopefully you'll uh, expand the market and more and more people will actually watch uh, this documentary. What is the one most important take that you hope that, you know, people would walk away with after watching this film? I really think it's what Julie was just illuminating that, you know, this issue can get reduced to sound bites and statistics and be politicized. And, and because zero tolerance, there's not the same crisis at the border, it can be moved aside and people are focusing on, on other issues that it's an opening for conversation and an understanding that there is something that we can do and that we need comprehensive immigration reform and that needs to come through congressionally. That, you know, to have a change of administration with policy changing, it's like this pendulum swings and there's whiplash, but we need something much more cohesive. And I think it just gives audiences the tools to start understanding the issue from maybe a different perspective that they didn't have. Marty, you're-, oh, you're, you're... Sorry, I'm muted because uh, it doesn't matter why I'm muted. Um, <laughs> I would say similarly, and this may be a more cynical point of view, um, you know, we can't expect Congress to ask, to mm -hmm. act. Um, we've been asking that um, back and forth for, you know, as the movie points out, you know, over a century. Um, so what can we do? And to me, the film is just so, um, you know, it gives hope to something that feels often very hopeless. Um, and it gives, yeah, as Marie was saying, the tools for people to um, actually feel empowered to, to make a difference. And to me, that's, you know, I've worked for a long time with Every Town and Moms Demand Action. And I remember after the March for Our Lives, you know, I was talking to Shannon Watts and um, she said, the marches are great. They're, they're, um, they're kind of like great PR, but this is a long haul issue. And this is a drip, 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 state by state, you know, city by city. You make the change at that grassroots level. And let's just call it the other side. They've been doing that forever. Um, and we need to be doing the same on all these issues that we care about. Right. I, I guess, uh, Julie, I guess you, your, your, your last word, and I, I guess you're going to present our call to action. <laughs> I, I mean, it really is, is, is exactly what Marty's saying. It's really an invitation to um, find your place, right? I think what both surprised me and leaves me endlessly grateful about <laughs> 
the process of, of IFT has been seeing how many people just wanted to be told what to do, right? The thousands and thousands of people, no exaggeration, have contacted us, um, particularly in the beginning, but still today to say, how can I help? Um, and that's the driving question. I think for so many people, it's hard for them to come up with the answer, right? But I hope that this film is an invitation to really think deeply about how can I help? Um, not just around the issue of immigration, right? But around whatever issue is feels sort of personal and moving to you that calls to you to not feel that it's the sort of the domain of government or the domain of some special interest group or or established organization to sort of solve the problem because a lot of the problems also maybe aren't solvable fully right but to um, to mitigate the impact right to at least decide i'm going to make um life better for and with um, at least a handful of other people. And one of the things that we have um, been really conscious about at IFT, I will often get pushback from funders who will say, but you're not operating at scale. Don't you want to scale? And I say, no, I don't want to scale. I want to help 124 families really, really well. I don't want to give them a meal and then today and say, oh, that's great. We served a million meals. And then tomorrow they don't have anything to eat, right? They don't have anything to eat next week. I want to make sure that for these 124 folks for whom we posted bond, they're living lives that are really stable, that allow them to be healthy and whole and to progress toward their asylum outcome and whatever their own personal and professional goals are. Hi. Hi. Oh. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Home from school. <laughs> So that's what I hope that the, the film does, is that it's an invitation to really, to be in conversation with one's community, but also to be in conversation with oneself about um, the locus of your own personal power, because we have immense power individually. And then collectively, when we add that all up, we can be pretty fierce. That is true. And this is a very powerful film. Ladies, thank you very much uh, for speaking to us about uh, your film, it, it is going to, it's going to open a lot of eyes. So everyone should check out Split the Root. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.